And then I think from there it just stemmed and he said, oh, do you want to do you want to jump in as the, the MC? And, um, yeah, so I ended up doing that and I did the live stream commentating as well. So Did you like the commentating side of things? Oh, yeah, I love doing that. I've done yeah. that a few times now. So, you know, sitting ringside, best seats in the house <laughs> and just commentating fights is easy. It's like second nature. But being an MC and being in the ring, that's that's another ball game. That was difficult. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> In what way? What, what was confronting about that? Is it because of the intimacy of talking into a microphone when you're commentating or just because you, it's in front of you, whereas when you're emceeing it's kind of like, oh, hang on, I am the centre of attention, yeah. maybe people are watching. Yeah, I think that uh, it, public speaking is totally a skill which I have not yet mastered if I'm not talking about martial arts. <laughs> 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 so that was difficult. I think as well, to be honest, like I've always uh, grown up watching male MCs. So mm -hmm. to then hear myself on the mic, like obviously with a female voice, you know, I don't have that deep, deep voice. It was kind of confronting to me like, oh, I'm actually doing something completely out of the norm here. Yeah. People aren't used to hearing a female's voice mm. behind the mic um, at a fight event. So I think I put too much pressure on myself, but I mean, it went okay. Yeah, it went I great. Right. I, I learned a lot. And by the end of the night, I was so much more confident. It took me a few fights to go, actually, if I just relax and enjoy this and, and be myself, it's going to be all right. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to know what sub personality to engage in because, like, you've got that, well, you, you know how to support the fighters and you know when you're commentating kind of you, you don't have to, you just got to be in observance of what's going on, but you really have to kind of imbibe this this whole different personality when you're the, you know, you're trying to build the crowd up or you're trying to, you know, you, you want to be really respectful for the fighters. You want to make it their moment as well. And, yeah, there's, there is a little, there's a bit more pressure. Are there any other female uh, MCs or ring announcers that are around the world that, at all or anybody that you could kind of look at and think, oh, yeah, there's a chick that's doing it. I could kind of do things that way or was it just like me watching Bruce Buffer videos? <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't actually seen another female no, MC a one. fight event. Plenty of them one. commentate yeah. but I personally haven't watched a show where there's been a female doing it. So hmm. that's what made me really nervous. And obviously it was the first time I'd done it and so I didn't actually know how I sounded but the hard part was going from the mic to jumping on the live stream and making sure that I was clicking the right buttons and doing that. So that was really hard yeah. um, to manage both. But, yeah, it was a really cool experience and I'm, I'm glad that I gave it a crack. And do you and reckon I, I you'll do it again? Oh, I don't, if I got asked to do yeah. it again, I don't know. That's another that's, story. That's a yes, Ike. That's, that's a yes. Oh, <laughs> that's a whole other story. But I think now that the first one's done, I think I would – completely change how I did it and, yeah, so I yeah. would like to give it another go because I think I'd, I'd do heaps better. Wouldn't it be great to know that you were the first female ring announcer ever? I don't know about ever. Surely There's got to be one. It would have had to Is there? Do you know one? Yeah, we were telling you the other day. Uh, the, the Pride Fighting Championship. So they had um, in Oh, Japan. yeah. The I know yours is yeah, from yeah. Pride uh, as well. But yeah, yeah the, Look, crazy. in the English speaking world, maybe. Uh, she was speaking English. Oh, but, okay. <laughs> oh that's really cool. I'll have to was, check it out. Oh, it, she's insane. It, it's uh, a scream a thon. <laughs> oh. She's introducing the fighter, and the name will go for 40 seconds because yeah, love she's that. screaming and yelling. I <laughs> really wish I could have watched that before I did it. <laughs> oh, you wonder what angle that machine does. It's, it's very, very nuanced, but oh. yeah. <laughs> or, or has no nuance. <laughs> oh, for sure. But maybe an inspiration there. But could you hear yourself when you were talking on the mic, or did you hear um, your voice coming back? I, I could a little bit, and I kept just thinking to myself because I'm so used to hearing men behind the mic and so I was just thinking, wow, I've got such a high pitched voice. This sounds so strange, <laughs> but I mean. Yeah, I, I think it went okay. It was something different and I think it was that's pretty awesome. cool for a female to do it. And that's what Craig said. He was like, oh, you know, it'd be cool, you know, to have a female do it. So it was cool that he was on board with that and that he wanted to to give it a go. So Yeah. yeah. Well, you see it in, uh, you know, in terms of commentary, cricket, football, mm -hmm. it's it's almost normal to, uh, you know, have a, a female voice in, involved. Um and how do you, when you watch those sports, or do do you watch any? Are you into any other sports? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So when when you see that, what what what's your thoughts about the emergence of, of female commentary and the like in these sports? Yeah, I love it. I think it's great. I think females bring just a different perspective, and it is good to 
to mm. hear sort of both sides because from what I've watched, females, you know, they might pick up on different things to what the males do. So yep. I think it's good to have that balance. And, you know, obviously there's a big shift in sport at the moment with gender equality. So I think that's a really good start to have females behind the mics and have, you know, the crowd and spectators hearing a female voice as well. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. With the, uh, sorry, yeah, with the Apex uh, event, so there was your uh, fighters that were on the card as well were, when you were doing the live stream and you were introducing everyone. Was it fighters that were from your club or from SA that you were familiar with and it was like hard to sort of keep that bias, like I really want them to win but I'm trying not to <laughs> show that um, when I'm speaking on, on on watching the live stream, it's like, oh, go, oh, no. I'm, uh. yeah. <laughs> well, we were actually meant to have a fighter on the car but unfortunately he got injured a few weeks out um, But so I haven't commentated where my own fighter has been in the ring. I think right. that would be very difficult. I'd probably end up just yelling down the microphone. It would be terrible. Take care, take care. <laughs> um, but yeah, like Coaching from the sidelines. <laughs> get up, get up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the um, the people on the live stream will be really over that. I um, but no, I think it's it makes it a lot easier being in the community and actually knowing these fighters personally because you can share parts of their story that you might know that, you know, someone that's just stepping into the role wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, giving them a little bit of exposure as well, you know, like even some fighters, you know, that they might be a parent. I think that's pretty cool, you know, sharing that on the live stream, you know, oh, that's a full-time teacher there, got three kids, yet he's in the ring tonight. So, yeah. like, having that personal approach, I think, um, yeah, I think it makes it a little bit more exciting. Absolutely, yeah, for sure. Uh, this was, um, it was Muay Thai kickboxing that was going on at the Apex event, or was it? Yeah. Right, awesome. And a world champion right here. <laughs> Maybe now's the time. <laughs> <All right. laughs> we'll we'll just start it. the episode now, right. and here Matt's going to go. take things away today. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Daily Combat Podcast. I'm your host today, Hollywood Mac Connolly, joined by real estate mogul, <laughs> Dave Stockbridge. Uh, our guest today is world champion Muay Thai kickboxer, a third degree black belt uh, in karate. She runs her own uh, events for kickboxing, the Pride, Pride Fighting Fox. Championship, Pride uh, Organization, works full-time at, at her own martial arts gym, has been doing martial arts for over 20 years. It's Carly Gangel. All right. Thanks Welcome to the podcast, me. Carly. Thank you. Thanks for having me on the show. Great to be here. So, uh, so Carly, um, what, what's your first memory of martial arts? Oh, my first memory of martial arts. I remember being really tiny. So I reckon I was about three years old. Um, and I remember just running into my family's martial arts centre. <laughs> I just run a mark. I wasn't even in a gi. I was just kind of there to to look around. And I remember watching my brother and sister train. So um, and, and dad was coaching, and mum was just you know, sitting around watching. So, um, yeah, my earliest memories are just being in the center, hearing the timer, hearing the yelling, hearing, you know, people hit the bags. So, yeah, it was kind of like my first memories of life were in a martial arts gym. So, you know. It's almost in the DNA, you could say. So, so really there was the no blood. choice in the matter. You're always going to be involved. Always, absolutely. As soon as we were able to, um, my parents had us into self-defense, whether we wanted to go down the official martial arts you know, journey, that was up to us. But, yeah, we were definitely taught self-defence from the second we could stand on two feet. So, <laughs> and, and some people in that situation feel some kind of pressure or some kind of legacy on their shoulders. Have, have you ever felt that way? Um, not particularly. I think I fell in love with it. Like it was um, my brother and sister were both heavily involved in it and they both fought in boxing and, and sort of had the same path as me. But um, they took different directions in life. But, you know, from the second I started as a kid, I knew it was what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So uh -huh. I guess I never felt that direct pressure. But, I mean, also following in my family's footsteps, there's definitely pressure there because, you know, they made quite big names for themselves and um, my father's got quite big shoes to fill with the club that he's developed over so many years. So a little bit of pressure there. <laughs> and are, are your siblings still actively involved in the sport? Yeah, so they, they both train still. Um, their kids train now as well, which <laughs> is really cool, next generation. Um, but, yeah, they're, they're not competitive anymore. So, yeah, it's just me. <laughs> it's all on you now. All on me. And, and so from a very young age, was there a sporting aspiration associated with it in terms of oh, one day I'm going to be the world champion or was it just like 
I just, I don't know anything different. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm just going to hang around in the gym until I'm the best in the world. Yeah, I think well, I was so competitive. Like I wanted to fight. The second I went to my first fight show, I was like, that's me. I'm hmm. in there. That's that's my life. Um, but, yeah, I was made to, to wait. My parents were like, no, you're not doing it. But, so I was really made to prove myself, um, which ended up working out well in the long run. I kind of earned my spot. So, yeah, I knew pretty quickly that I wanted to compete and I wanted to make it my, my passion in life. So, and, and with mum and dad holding you back a little bit because uh, because you are a girl and they weren't too sure or or was it where you did you ever feel there was any resistance to that or was it like there's no difference you you you're in there yeah definitely no difference, no difference. <laughs> <laughs> definitely no difference I reckon I was brought up as if I was a boy actually <laughs> um, but yeah I think it was just more so um, parents were probably harder harder on us kids than what they were on anyone else in the in the gym or the club so. Um, again, I think I was just made to earn my spot. Mm. Yeah. How old were you when you went to your first fight show? I was 11 years old. 11. And 11. you wanted to get in straight away. I did. I was <laughs> like, I trained so hard. It was, oh, gosh, I literally probably trained more than what I was at school. I was committed. <laughs> and I didn't get to have my first fight until I was 15. Ooh. So it was a long wait. And I was sort of training literally my whole my whole um, childhood, so I did have to wait. But again, I think it worked out better in the end. What was I, it? What was it like getting in there for the first time when they were fifteen, and you're like, "This is it"? Were you excited or were you sort of nervous? And it was oh, a- it was a bit of everything. I just went wild. I was I was like a, a caged animal that was like let out finally for the first time. But yeah, it was um, yeah, it was exhausting. <laughs> did the technique kind of go out the window? Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. It did. Like Dad yelling at you in the corner. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it was such a big step up as well because I didn't just have my first fight. I actually went to the Australian titles for my first fight. Oh, like, <laughs> of course, start at the top. Why not? <laughs> yeah, so my parents were like, no, nah, this is this is your start point. Get in there and do it. And then I actually won gold. Wow. Um, <laughs> wow. I won gold at my first my first event. So, um, yeah. And was that expected? Did you go in there believing that that was likely or was when you achieved that, was that like, oh, it's a bit of a surprise. Oh, total surprise. Was, I didn't yeah. know what I was in for. I didn't care about winning. I didn't care about any gold medal. I was like, I just want to get in there and give this a red hot crack. So, yeah, it was pretty cool to come out with an, an achievement. Um, so, but, yeah, I, was, I didn't know what to expect. Wow. I just wanted to fight. <laughs> <laughs> How many how many fights did you have to go through for the Australian titles? Um, I had two up there, right? right? Um, so yeah, it wasn't too much. There weren't a lot of females even back then. Like I'm talking like I'm heaps old, <laughs> <laughs> but just back then, five, um, five years old. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Seventy two in Muay Thai years. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, back then that was a pretty um, a pretty busy division, female mm. divisions, and there was three of us. So <laughs> um, yeah. Wow. It was cool. And the next the next time I went to the titles, it was a lot different. You know, it started to build up and females, you know, there was more and more of them. But, mm-hmm. um, yeah, when I was 11 and went to that first fight show, I actually watched my first female fight. Um, she's one of my best friends now, but it mm-hmm. was that's what, you know, watching the guys was awesome. But when I saw females get up there, I was like, oh, wow. this is epic. I want to do that. Yeah, so, for sure. Did you have yeah. anyone that was like an idol throughout your sort of history of, of watching Muay Thai, like whether it was a guy or a girl, you're like, I love that guy's style or that girl's style. That's what I want to emulate in the ring. Was there anything, anybody that you were like, yes, that's that's the person I love and I want to go out like that, that's sort of emulate that? Oh, yeah, there was a couple. Um, so there were two local girls. One was Anita Pagnani and one was Christy Litster. So they were both local Adelaide girls and they were they started fighting when, you know, females weren't meant to fight. So I remember I was very, very young and Anita said to me, um, she's like, oh, I'm fighting on the weekend. And she mentioned that she had to keep this life um, completely you know, hidden from her parents. So, you know, huh. back then it was really wow, a thing taboo, yeah. of females not fighting and I didn't understand that at the time. But mm. then when I went to that show and I watched them in there, um, still to this day they are my idols because they they made me want to do it and they were, you know, competing in a time where it was difficult for females to do that. So, uh, yeah, I just think they're amazing. And, and how long ago is this? Oh, okay, I cannot do maths, but I was eleven. I'm now twenty three. <laughs> so not that long ago. No, not it that wasn't. Long ago. We oh gosh, females in sport, especially combat sports, we've come so far. Like honestly, I haven't um, 
can honestly say I've always been treated equal. I've had really good treat, treatment as a, a female athlete. Um, but I know that many of my friends that I watched as I was growing up, you know, they didn't have that luxury. So it's really interesting to to know that. And I try and explain that to a lot of my students now. You know, these are the women that have paved the way for us. Um, and it really wasn't, you know, my sort of time when I was fighting. It was just before me. Not that long before me, and but it was. Are any of your students today meeting any of that resistance anymore, do you think? Oh, uh, definitely not. No? Definitely not. I mean, there's it's there's amazing. things out there. You're yeah. pushing but, them into the ring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you will yeah. fight tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there's still, you know, people still make comments and stuff, but that's not combat sports specific. I think now, like, females, we get equal opportunity in combat sports. Well, I feel like we do anyway. Like my card on Pride Fight Series, I've got 50% male, 50% female. Yeah. There's females on the main card females, you know, jumping in for their first fight. So, it yeah, is, I think we've come a long way. Is that a conscious decision or is that just happening organically as women are attracted to the sport now? Um, it's a little bit of both, I think. Um, yeah. I make a conscious effort to always match the females. So yeah. um, if I can't match them locally, I'll fly fly them in. Um, but I, I think there's a lot more females getting into it, which is really awesome. A lot of gyms have got, you know, that real balanced uh, balance of genders. I know at our gym, like our female programs are huge. Like our female fight team is growing rapidly wow. um, to the point where I'm like, wow, I kind of need to match my fighters against each other yeah. <laughs> just so they can fight. Um, but, yeah, I think it's grown a huge amount, which yeah. is cool. So we didn't really uh, touch onto it, but you, you do you have your own promotion. And, of course, with COVID and the recent difficulties, you've got a, an upcoming event. How has that been impacted and how difficult is it to run an event in the in the current uh, COVID era? Oh, gosh, it's oh. Uh, almost impossible. But um, as I was saying, you know, we touched on it before, you, you just have to keep trying for the fighters. Like I've been there just to have promoters that are trying and if we get lucky and the event goes ahead, that's amazing. But, you know, we can't just sit back and say, oh, we'll just wait till COVID goes through because otherwise nothing will get done. So, yeah, I've got four weeks until my event. COVID's mm. rearing its ugly <laughs> head again. <laughs> but I'm going to keep going until... All and, hope is lost. Uh, yep, that's right. So the fighters are training hard, so I've got to do my bit and make sure that everything's in place if the event gets to go ahead. So. And the event that you're talking about, four weeks' time, is? Pride <laughs> Fight Series, so pure Muay Thai right here in Adelaide. Oh, <laughs> fantastic. And where can people buy tickets for that? Oh, they can go to the Pride website or they can purchase from participating clubs. Fantastic. So, um, and on the 24th of July. So yeah, correct. that's right. Down south at the Norlunga Leisure Centre. So we've um, recently changed venues, obviously, to allow for capacity just in case restrictions change. You know, we've got to have all that extra wasted space, but <laughs> that's just what we've got to do. <laughs> that's just what we've got to do. Um, so so uh, what what led to this transition from from athlete to promoter? Um, I think obviously um, I had a pretty exciting fight career and I had promoters that definitely uh, paved the way for me to have the career that I did. Um, when I got to fight interstate, there are a few promo promotions that really stood out to me, the professionalism um, and the, the sanctioning bodies that they were with. So, you know, the real prestigious ones like WMC, which is the World Muay Thai Council, and also WBC, World Boxing Council, and we didn't, ha we don't have that in Adelaide for Muay Thai specifically. So um, when I started uh, coaching my own fighters, I thought, you know, they don't have the opportunity locally to fight on a sanctioned show like that. Mm -hmm. So well, why don't I just do it? <laughs> just to, to give them an opportunity, and that we had some real, like we do have some really amazing up and coming um, Muay Thai fighters. So. Um, you know, if we don't have that show locally where we can get them, them those state titles, they really can't take that step up into the A class and fight for it nationally. They're quite strict on the ranking system. So um, I promised myself that no matter how difficult it was, I was going to stick to my sanctioning body of WMC and um, try and build up some locals to, to give them the opportunities to go into state and go overseas. So, wow. yeah, it, that's why I decided to to do that. And, yeah, it's been been a fun ride. Difficult, but <laughs> <laughs> good. <it>. Well, yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> more difficult over the last couple of weeks, obviously. Oh, oh. gosh, yeah, d- absolutely. And I've um, this one event that I'm trying to get up and going. I've postponed it twice so far. So, but I'm going to keep trying. I don't give up, you know. So we'll mm. see how we go. Fingers crossed. That's right. And your main event of that. You've got a couple of – how many fights have you got on that card? I actually have 18 fights wow. matched. Yeah, Ooh. yeah, yeah. So it's absolutely huge. Um, 14 of those are locally matched, which is amazing. That's huge. Uh, yep, all full tie rules fights um, sanctioned by, by WMC. So, um, yeah, that's pretty cool. Obviously, some of the fights are matched with interstate fighters. So mm. I literally have – around two to four backups for every fight, depending on which states <laughs> our borders will be opened to. Yeah. So, yeah, our fingers and toes crossed that one state, we open our borders to one state and then I'll fly in from there. So our local fighters are just preparing to fight anyone. So mm. I just said that to them. I said, just prepare, be ready, and I will do my absolute best to fly someone of quality in from a state. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's an absolutely massive card. I'm really excited. So that's awesome. Mm. And um, you said uh, full Muay Thai rules. So does that mean that some organisations have restrictions on what you can and can't do in terms of like elbows or all that sort of thing? Yeah, they do. So it, it also depends on the promoter. So some promoters choose to negotiate their rules, um, but under Muay Thai Australia, which is the um, government supported body for Muay Thai, mm-hmm. um, it is Muay Thai rules. So by definition, Muay Thai includes elbows and clinching. Mm-hmm. Um, so from amateur level, that's that's the rules that they fight with, which means that by the time they get to 10 fights, they're seasoned and we're just going to, we're up with the other states. You know, if, if people are fighting what we call modified tie rules, um, you know, they get all that experience under the wrong rule set and then actually have to change their style mm-hmm. when they get a little bit more experience. So mm-hmm. all of our amateurs start start at the top <laughs> with, all, with all the proper rules, no uh. restrictions. Obviously we have padding for the amateurs, um, but, yeah, I just find that people develop quicker, they fight a lot smarter when, you know, there's elbows involved and knees to the head. So, mm. yeah. And what's the pathway for young talent who you say you've got some new fighters that might get their first shot on the 24th and what's their journey from there if they're successful? Where, where can they where can they move? What What's the natural pathway for them forward? Yep. Um, so essentially uh, Muay Thai Australia are doing pretty great things um, f- for pathways for, um, for amateur fighters. So um, we've actually got a couple of shows that are starting up in South Australia under Muay Thai Australia. So I'm the South Australian rep for that. Mm-hmm. So I'm really um, grateful to be involved with all the promotions that are creating that pathway. So we've got a new show which is called SA Muay Thai League and that is pretty much for amateurs that are from Zimbabwe zero to five fights. So um, Barry and Carr from Southside promote that show. Um, so what we're doing is trying to build people up. Um, it's a little bit of a path- pathway to a show like mine, which is that more step up, you know, we've got pros on the card. Um, and then we actually have a big nationals event, which is where I had my first fight. And you can go there, um, have a tournament style fight. You might have between one and sort of six fights. If you win a gold medal, you then get that pathway to go to the world championships, which is absolutely massive. Some of the biggest fighters in the world have actually fought um, on that. So mm. um, Valentina, who's in the UFC, yeah. she won so many of wow. the the world titles uh, under um, that Muay Thai organisation. So you can just see the quality of fighters that that Jeez. pathway actually yeah. yeah it's it's really cool so um we're still quite a baby state in south australia with building that up but it's definitely happening um and i'm also about to start up a development day for juniors so i'm going to try and run some weekend training camps where um, a lot of juniors can come along and just learn from different trainers get involved um, do a little bit more sparring because at the moment we actually don't have a pathway for juniors at all in South Australia mm-hmm. um, for kickboxing or Muay Thai. So that's my next goal after Pride is done. <laughs> <laughs> for those kids that aren't born into a, a, a martial arts dynasty, they're, yeah, they're, that's we've got right. to create pathways for them. <laughs> straight into the ring. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, at the end of the day, you know, like where's the next generation coming from? If we don't have something in place, then... Mm-hmm. You know, we don't have our next lot of fighters to come through and make a name for themselves in South Australia. And amongst, sorry. Oh, yeah. Um, so when you won the gold medal at 15, 
that qualified you to go to the world championships? And and did you go through with that straight away? I actually didn't. No, um, because I was I was just too too inexperienced. But sure. I actually went back um, the year later and I won gold again. Wow. <laughs> then I went to my first world ah. titles event in uh, Langkawi in Malaysia. I was very amateur when I went over there and I had my first fight against uh, a girl with 200 fights <laughs> and it was my fourth or fifth fight. <sighs> Wow. So this is what I'm talking about, you know, like they were. And is this a much older competitor as well then? Um, and A little bit older, but, you know, she was my age and had those 200 wow. fights. So that just goes to show what junior pathways can do. She mm. is now an incredible athlete, like a, a top level athlete. So, you know, I just look at her and oh, she absolutely bashed me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but for me, it was proof in the pudding. I was like, junior pathways is where it's at, you know, so... Yeah, that she's event. Still, she's still fighting now. Just... She absolutely is. So yeah, Neve Kineham. She, if anyone follows K One, she is massive now over right. in the UK. And yeah, she's always been my motivation in the back of my head to eventually get something going for juniors because Incredible. yeah, she's got an amazing career. And it's be- she always says in every interview, it's because of the opportunity she was given as a junior that led her to that career. So, yeah. Was that through she was living in, in Thailand or something or she was that, that – where, where was she from? She was from the UK. So they've mm. got an amazing, um, amazing junior programs over there. So do, so do Russia, oh, you right. know, countries like that. They've, um, they've got – So a, what, are, what are the yeah. powerhouse countries at the moment? Oh, um, Thailand's always strong, obviously, very <laughs> strong. Um, UK, America and, yeah, Russia always, always have strong teams at these events. So – um, the IFMA World Championships is essentially like the Olympics for Muay Thai. So, yeah, it's been some pretty epic fighters come out of those tournaments. So wow. with these young people that are finding their way to your club, um, what's their first exposure to Muay Thai? What, what leads them to be attracted to the sport? Um, to be honest, a lot of people that come into our gym actually have no idea what combat sports is about other than right. watching UFC. A okay. lot of them watch UFC. But if I'm honest, probably over 50% of people come in with not a clue about what combat sports is about. Mm. It's because they feel like they're lacking self-confidence. That is the leading reason that we have people walk into our club. Mm. Um, That might not be every club, but we're quite a a family-friendly club. We've got all ages and, like I said, we've got, you know, male, female, it's 50-50. So we find that a lot of people are coming in to to learn self-defence and and gain a little bit of self-confidence. It's very rarely that very rare that people come in and be like, I want to fight. And you know what? They're the ones that don't actually last. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> they do one lesson that, like, oh, this is too hard. <laughs> Conor McGregor makes this look easy. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they come in, um, they, they sort of get introduced to the fighting styles that you've, you're presenting at your club there and they do some training and they might ne- not necessarily be like, I want to do this to have a fighting career, but they might over time start developing some skills and enjoying it and be like, you know what, I do we have a fight? Can I get a fight? Like, yeah, it, and it's always the people that you least expect. It's the quiet person in the, the corner ones. of the room. Mm. Yeah, it's not um, It's not often, in my experience, the people that have got amazing athletic talent. It's, um, yeah, the people that kind of want to prove something to themselves and often they become the best fighters, you know, the ones that don't have an ego. They're just there to to do themselves proud. So They're there to yeah. learn and, and, and pick up some skills so that they've got some well, life skills essentially, and then what comes next after that? Who knows? Yeah, that's right. I think MMA gyms would be a bit different, obviously, because UFC is so massive. Um, people would watch it and be like, "All right, I want to go and do mixed martial arts." Muay Thai is not as mainstream, so people aren't exposed to it. So people walk into a martial arts club or our club in particular, they don't actually know what they want to do. It's just that that's kind of one style that we specialise in. So that's the pathway they're forced to take, <laughs> which I find really interesting. Right. So if, if a beginner is coming into your club for the first time, uh, what sort of classes and training programs could they get involved in straight away? Yeah. Um, so our club in particular, we have got quite big Muay Thai programs. So we've got juniors, um, mixed classes, fight classes um, and female classes. And then we also have... Um, we have a traditional martial arts in karate. Um, so that one's really popular and that has um, our self-defense programs in it as well, which is massive for the kids. Um, and then we've just got your standard fitness and strength and conditioning classes. So when we have people come into the gym, I never try and convince them to do one or the other. I encourage them to try a little bit of everything, 
see what it is that they want to get out of the training. If if we can't offer it, I'll you know send them on to somewhere where I think they're going to get the style that they that they want. So mm. yeah, we've kind of got a mixed bag at the gym. <laughs> Do you see the change in confidence over time with somebody that might come in a little a little sheepish or a little like? Uh, reserved and then as they gain those skills you can really see them uh start to build the character and, and come out of it uh, oh yeah, yeah <laughs> it's it's absolutely amazing that is actually my favorite part about being a trainer is seeing someone that lacks self-confidence just completely transform into someone that believes in themselves and you know feels like they can conquer the world and i think combat sports does that for people you know knowing that you can take a hit and hit back and you get knocked down you get back up like mm. oh, i wish everyone had the opportunity to train in combat sports because it, it teaches you so much about yourself. So, yeah, it's definitely the best part is seeing how people can change and transform their their lives. Mm, absolutely. We were talking about that a few weeks ago with, uh, you know, humility with uh, mm. combat sports. It seems to be that you can't go in thinking that you're absolutely awesome because you will get exposed uh, and, and over and over again. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's it. There's got to be a balance. Like you've definitely got to be confident and believe in yourself. Like we see that with Conor McGregor, don't we, in the, in the media. But, um, yeah, martial arts definitely can humble you as well. You know, I've had my fair share of bashings. Um, but, yeah, that's part of the fun. Exactly. That's <laughs> right. And that's where you come back stronger. Like, yeah, it's that a difference of uh, mentality and psychology where if you – Come and go and look I'm, at the very start. I know I'm not going to be good at this, but I really want to give it a go. And I think that if I put in the time and effort, I can get good at it. Mm. Um, I think that attitude is where you will find the people that will really shine. Whereas somebody that's like, I am awesome at everything and I'll kick everyone's ass. And <laughs> they step in and as you said, one lesson later, they're like, nah, it's too hard. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's it. And it comes back to, like as I mentioned, that the fighters that really sometimes make it are the ones that don't have that ego because they're willing mm. to learn. They're willing to, you know, accept defeat sometimes. So, yeah, they make the, the easiest people to train. <laughs> <laughs> so have you ever had a chance to try any other sports? Or have you ever been curious to try any other sports? Oh, I have, yeah. Nothing even comes close, to be honest. But yeah. um, I did grow up doing a lot of different stuff. You know, I did um, did it with footy. I did some cricket. I played a lot of netball. Um, now, as an adult, um, I've been dabbling in a bit of CrossFit. Hmm. Um yeah, it's a, but I keep coming back to, to combat sports. It's once you've done combat sports, I don't think you can go to anything else. Like it's nothing gives you that feeling like combat sports does. And what, and what do you think it is about combat sports in particular? That that What is that feeling? It's terrifying. <laughs> yeah. That's what I think it is. Like there's, It's the oh, constant fear of death. Yeah. 100%. It's, and getting in gives the ring. Gives you an edge. Yes, it does. Like getting in the ring, whether it's a fight or just in training, it's like, wow. I could have my ass handed to me right now, or, you know, I might do okay. Mm. But it's just that it, it kind of feels like you're living on the edge a little bit. like, And you're always testing yourself, like mm. always. And it's not just about being physically strong. You've got to be mentally strong because there's times in training, like we all know that you just feel absolutely defeated. So, mm. um, yeah, it's it's just different yeah. other sports, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, that's all right. Sorry, I keep talking over you. <laughs> You're the host today. No, you you can well. do what you like. <laughs> um, the high that you get when you win, uh, do you remember like your highest point in your career where you've gone, this, nothing's ever going to top this? Um, I had a couple. So obviously winning the IFMA world title was pretty epic because I just had an exhausting lead up to that. I remember that particular event I was actually in year 12 so I was managing studying wow. running my business and then doing that and mm. cutting weight god what a time um but I reckon my biggest high was uh one of my last fights um I fought a really tough opponent like I really was the underdog um and and from our gym one of our um instructors actually passed away a month before I was set to fight so oh. Um, I really uh, channeled that in my fight and I just went out there and I'd never performed like that. And I remember mm. when I won, I just remember thinking that was a totally different person and he was in the ring with me that night. And, um, yeah, I think that was my biggest high because it was such a meaningful win to me um, and to my family and to our whole club. So, um, yeah, I think... I I can't actually remember what it was, but I think I think I won by knockout in round three or something, and I just mm. 
completely dished out a pretty epic performance. There was a lot of knees to the head thrown. Um, so, yeah, I think that was probably my highest and it was a little bit not so much about the win or the actual performance but just more the emotional win for that one. Mm. Probably wouldn't have even cared if I lost just as long as I, hmm. you know, felt good getting in there. <laughs> and have you ever had a, a particular career plan in mind when it comes to fighting? Like have you? ever thought of a trajectory or has it been quite organic? It's just been one fight after the other. Uh, it's been pretty organic. I think um, things move quite quickly when you're training, you know, mm. like as a fighter, all I cared about was, all right, I'm just going to train, be fit, be the best I can be and whatever opportunity comes, then it'll come. Like I really didn't uh, set myself a, a real goal. I think now if I was to go back to fighting, um, I, I would definitely have one. Now that we've got one championship, that's a game changer. Mm. Like that wasn't, you know, it's only really just becoming a, a massive thing. So to aim for something like that would be pretty pretty cool. And then, so, so you've retired? Oh, I wouldn't say retired. You, you put your career on pause? Uh, have, I actually uh, just. What, what's, your, what's your fighting status <laughs> at the moment? Oh, I don't actually know. Well, because I'm only 23, I've got time on my side. Yeah, I was going to say. So um, I'm at the moment. <laughs> 23, you've done so much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I feel like such a loser. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, so I think if I just take, I'm focusing on, on training my fighters and getting my promotion up. And once I've got that junior pathway, I think I'll feel more comfortable going back into competing again so I could go back at 25 and I feel like I'd still be in in my prime time so yeah. um yeah and, and what is the prime for for a Muay Thai fighter oh that do you know what you think you know the answer and then you look at John Wayne Parr who's late 40s and yeah. it's like well <laughs> you know you I just I always tell people like don't let age uh, limit you because there's so many examples of older fighters absolutely killing it. Um, Kaylee Reese, uh, I don't know if you know who that is. She was a a world champion from Perth, and she um, she had her first fight something like 27, and she went on to win world titles. Wow. So hmm. um, you know the age is definitely not a limit. So I think I'll just um, focus on what I'm doing now, and then. Um, I'll definitely go back to fighting. I can't live without it. I'm the same person. Um, but yeah. What have been the rigors on your body so far? Because you're relatively young, but you've had a pretty extensive career thus far. So, what what kind of injuries are you carrying, or or what are things that you're now mindful of as you maybe have half an eye to the future? Oh gosh, yeah, there's a few. Um, but to be <laughs> honest, I've been so much more injured in the last year doing CrossFit and back when, <laughs> back when I was playing netball. What a surprise. Like, yeah, I know, I know. Um, and playing netball back in the day um, at, a, at a decent wow. level. Like the injuries were way worse. People go, oh, I don't know how you could could get in there and fight. I'm like, you don't understand. The injuries are nowhere near as bad as some other sports that are non -con non contact. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I really fight wise, I never really had any serious injuries, but I did. Um, sort of times are a little bit different now, even with how I am with fighters, my fighters now, and that's um, issues around weight cutting. So mm. as a young female. Um, you know, back then, when I say back then, like I'm old again, um, you know, when I was. Uh, in the old yeah. days. <laughs> in the old days. Six months ago. <laughs> in 2018. Um. Well, yeah, the, the weight cut was a little bit different, you know, so it was a lot of saunering. It was a lot of wearing sweatsuits to run. It was really restricting the diet, you know. So um, I did that as a very young female and then I found that I've, you know, as I've gotten a little bit older, I have faced some some issues, mm -hmm. um, particularly, you know, I had problems with my kidneys, unfortunately, when I cut weight for um, uh, a couple of title defences, which were at a weight that, you know, probably wasn't natural for me. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, times are different now. You know, we don't – I would never let my fighters do what I did back right. then. And, and what do you think has changed in terms of uh, – is is it the knowledge now that – the, of the damage that you're doing, like uh, to, to the brain, to the kidneys, is that now there's greater awareness amongst trainers? Absolutely there is. So mm. we actually, in the Muay Thai community, we've had a couple of deaths in the last, oh, it, 
you know, four or five years ago. These are um, not netball related deaths. These are, no. <laughs> the, <laughs> you know Cross, what? Netball's Cross probably, Cross 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 probably <laughs> higher, higher yeah. rate. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think uh, there's greater awareness. There's We now have professionals that are, you know, specialize in dieting and nutrition for combat sports, which is a game changer. Mm. Um, so I think that's made a big difference. And I think as well, it's the change of generation. So the old school ways, are making their way out and the new, you know, the new times are in. So, you know, people actually training to perform rather than training to lose weight. Um, one example that we see in the Muay Thai community is it in the, it used to be, all right, 10K run every single morning. Mm. Now we have proper strength and conditioning programs. We have more sprints, more high intensity work, more rest days, more recovery. So, you know, as a whole, and that's probably across all sports, you know, times have just changed and the old school ways are making their way out. So mm. weight cutting is definitely not as extreme as what it was I'm even so when I started. Weight cutting. I hate weight cutting. I have a whole thing on this. I think it's ridiculous. I, I, oh, yeah. it's terrible. And, and what was the weight? So you, when you were feeling like it was a, it was a really arduous weight cut, what, what, where did you start off and, and what was what were you trying to get down to? Um, so I won a title at 58 kilos. So naturally when I'm a fight fit, I'll walk around about 64, 65. Um, so for a grown male, that's not a lot of weight to cut, but mm. I was. But in percentage terms, that's Yeah, huge. yeah, yeah. So as a, as a young female, you know, like when I was walking around at that heavy weight, I was strong, I was lean, I was performing at my absolute peak. So to then strip that weight off was was pretty extreme for me. Mm. And was the was it the pressure to um to defend the belt or was it just that was your that was your game, that was your weight, so that's what you needed to get back to or Yeah, were, it definitely what? was. And to be honest, I was a stubborn fighter. I was mm. like, that's my title, that's my division. I've never fought <laughs> in another division. I'm gonna stick to that. But you know, obviously again I wasn't fully grown. I was growing up. I was getting over that eighteen mark, making my way into my twenties. So you know, mm. I wouldn't accept that, okay, I'm getting older, I actually need to shift divisions. So it, it, I take full responsibility for not wanting to shift divisions. But, um, again, even those horrible weight cut experience, like I remember passing out in the sauna, you know, mm. that stuff just doesn't, <sighs> well, it might, but in my experience it's just not happening now. Trainers are smarter, we've got better education, better resources. So, yeah, which is fantastic because, yeah, weight cutting just it needs to be kept to a minimum because, you know, one day you're not going to fight and those organs kind of matter. <laughs> uh, yeah, you might need them for the rest of yeah, your life. maybe. Well, just it, maybe. Um, we were talking to Izzy about this subject yesterday. Um, as she's getting into boxing now and she walks around at about 75 kilos. Looks strong, like mm. so strong. She's just uh, got a new promotional video that's just come out and she's uh, Sarah Connor style. She's doing the, <laughs> you know, the, the chin ups and, and she's, back she's muscles got, are just back. popping out. And yeah, look, amazing. Looks amazing. <laughs> but she was even commenting look, I probably to be sponsor friendly, need to be maybe five or 10 kilos less. Like there's this extra pressure to have an aesthetic. Whereas, I mean, in my eyes, she looks fantastic, and and she looks she looks fit. You know, she's strong. strong. Yeah. Um, but the you know, from her perspective, or looking from a commercial perspective, there's other pressures there. Have you uh, ever felt those other pressures? Um, yeah, I have. Hmm. I definitely have. I do remember a promoter actually saying to me once. Um, he offered me a massive fight, um, which was amazing. I was <laughs> like, oh yeah, get me in there. Yeah. Um, and he actually made a comment about me being the reason I got the opportunity was because I was marketable. I was in an ideal weight class. I looked ideal for what he was trying to achieve for the show. Yeah. And that was probably um, a big eye opener for me. I was like, oh, wow, that actually is an issue. You know, So that he is... probably meant that as a compliment and in the back of your mind you go, yes. hey, really? Yeah, in the back of my head I'm like, no, nah, I've actually trained my ass off to get that <laughs> opportunity, but okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I can completely understand why that pressure is there and, you know, hopefully as time goes on that, that goes away because it, that's not cool, you know. It's not Athletes cool. train very hard, and yeah, it's not. Well, it's not even healthy, you know. And I, and I think we're starting to see that emerge, and and the science is confirming that. And and your personal experiences obviously reflected that as well. Mm, yeah, hundred percent. What are the weight divisions in Muay Thai that you? So you were fifty eight kilos champion. Uh, mm -hmm. What would have been the next one up for that? Uh, so the next one up from that would have been the 60, sort of 60 kilo weight class. Oh, it's only two um, kilo different. Yeah, yeah. So it's not huge, but mm. I mean that it's that last, 
1.5 to 2 kilos that you're weight cutting that really does the damage, you know, mm. like. You can cut weight and still be hydrated, but the second you hit that point of dehydration, you know, that's mm. when when things go wrong. And that was it for me. I remember being in the sauna and thinking, This is this is it. This is when I'm gonna pass out. <laughs> oh, but I just kept thinking of that belt and I actually remember um a trainer being there and he was like, I just I can't put you in that ring and a doctor actually said, you know, you can you can't fight. But again, I was stubborn. I take responsibility <laughs> for that. I got in the ring, defended the title, and, yeah, it was all good days. But looking in hindsight, it wasn't a smart decision. Is there a big gap between the weigh-in and the fight in more time? Uh, 24 hours. Okay. And, and much of a bounce back in terms of your weight in, in that time? Because we had Greg Hearn mention, I think he put on about three and a half, four kilos in that 24-hour period between mm. weigh-in and, yeah. and fight time. Yeah, so which, have- is, which is actually not too bad, mm. I, I don't think. You know, yeah. I would um, I had a couple of fights where I'd weigh in at 58 and the next day, no, I'd be getting in the ring at 67, 68, so that's 10 kilos. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but not every fighter is like that. The less, towards the end of my career, I did things really smart. I barely cut weight, maybe a kilo on the day. Um and, you know, I'd get in the ring two or three kilos heavier, which is healthy. Mm. It's just having a big meal and hydrating back up. So, mm. yeah, that is big it, jump is not healthy. Mm. Is it one fighting championship that adopted that uh, no dehydration rule for weight cutting, which I think is fantastic, yes. mm. um, where they actually test your hydration levels. If you are dehydrated, you cannot fight. So mm. trying to eliminate that uh, dehydration style of people cutting weight to get their weight advantage into a fight, which I think is fantastic. Mm. Um, it's just, yeah, I'm so against weight cutting. I think it's- <laughs> Me too. Now, now right. after, but if I hadn't gone through what I did, you know, perhaps I wouldn't have, have that opinion. I don't know, because I was brought up in the- with old school trainers. Um, so, yeah, I'm kind of glad that I went through what I did. Mm. Um, but, yeah, I think the sport is changing. I know Boxing SA do same-day weigh-ins, mm. um, which, you know, they try to eliminate people cutting weight, getting in at their walk-around weight. Mm-hmm. Um, I know with my show um, I encourage people, obviously, not to cut weight at all. And you, you kind of know there are trainers that are really smart and, and put people in appropriate weight divisions. Um, and obviously, as you get to know the fighters, when we get nominations through, I know if that is too light for that fighter mm. and I will offer up a, a fight at a, at a heavier weight. So, um, you know, sometimes it comes back to the promoter. But at the end of the day, it is up to the trainers to be monitoring that and and just hoping that they're doing the right thing by their fighters. Mm. Biggest biggest increase that I've seen was Tito Ortiz. He uh, cut weight to 93 kilos and then that night he put a photo up on Instagram at 117 kilos. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. It just makes you wonder what that person's consumed. Like, how much can you fit in your body? (laughs) I think he did six bags of IV. This is when IVs were still legal, Uh, pasta and all that sort of thing. But, yeah, it's just an insane amount. You think how much. So when he's actually stepping in the cage, you know, it's a 93-kilo weight division, but he's weighing 117. Mm. So, Which, you know, to him it's a great advantage, but then, you know, that's a real danger. Mm-hmm. Like that is such a threat to the other fighter. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, that's the other thing that we need to be mindful of is that, you know, when you know, when fighters know how to use that weight, it becomes dangerous, especially Absolutely. if one fighter hasn't cut weight. So, yeah, yeah we've got to be mindful of that one. With those same day weigh-ins, I think the argument against those is that little fighters will still cut weight and they'll just fight dehydrated. Uh, whereas uh, that's why I really like the one uh, FC mm style where it's like you cannot be dehydrated no matter what mm. i think do they test you a couple of times in the week leading up to the weigh-in it's like- yeah they do and then i think it's uh one before the weigh-in and then one after the weigh-in as well i could be completely wrong but um there are several tests that they mm. that they take so mm. and you see um you know robert whitaker who was a mm. ufc middleweight champion so he was fighting at welterweight the weight class below cutting weight to get their extreme weight cuts that sort of thing uh, sort of winning one, losing one, got knocked out a couple of times and then ended up moving up to middleweight, won seven fights in a row, won the world championship. He said one of the big differences was when he fought at welterweight and he was stepping in the cage, he mm. felt like he hadn't, even though it was 24 hours after the weigh-in, he hadn't had that full rehydration. The fluid around his brain hadn't completely come back around. So he was getting knocked out easier from smaller hits. Whereas, uh, you know, if you're not cutting weight and you do have that, that proper fluid around mm. your brain, you, you, you're you more than likely, you know, a smaller hit or a smaller jar isn't going to affect you as badly. So mm. it just shows you how, 
uh, how That's devastating right. it can be for your body, even at 24 hours, because um, yeah, apparently it takes uh, up to about 40 hours for you to fully rehydrate. Mm. So. Well, yeah, a lot it's a of those scary, old, isn't it? old school theories about bigger is better have kind of fallen by the wayside as people become more cognizant of the fact that, you know, hydration is a big thing. How much mm. fluid on the brain mm. determines how much punishment you can hit, uh, you can take as well. So right. uh, all of those all of, all of those things, now as there's more money in these sports and more sponsorship dollars, uh, big sponsors don't want to see bad things happen in the ring. That's mm. one mm. thing, that's for sure. So more of these precautions are ensuring that fighters are probably safer now than they've ever been. Absolutely. Which, which is fantastic for all combat sports. Yeah, and plus you see such terrible performances sometimes. So a guy will have cut, you know, 20, 25 pounds of, of water weight and mm. they step in and they might win, but it's it's a shocking performance mm. and they're just trying to hold on. And it was mm. like, uh, mm. what would you have done if you were able to, you know, not have that? It's like you've done this 12-week camp, you're in fantastic fight shape, you've got all these skills, and then you completely go and dehydrate yeah, you yourself. It. Mm. Totally. One day before the fight. I've to yeah. I've totally fought like that. Absolutely terribly. And you get, you know, you win them and you're like, oh God, but that's so terrible. So it's it's like, you know, as a fighter, if someone was to say to me, All right, you're gonna go and run a half marathon tomorrow. Ask yourself, what are you going to go and consume? You're going to hydrate and you're going to have good nutritious food and you're going to have carbs. So it's like why, if that's what leads us to to peak performance, why on earth are we doing the complete opposite? <laughs> yeah. It just doesn't make sense. But I think it's it's a culture thing and yeah, it's, it's definitely changing for the better, which is great. And as a big uh, advocate for, for females in combat sports, what are your feelings around trans now making their way into combat sports is there a particular position that the the federations are taking or is there is it up to promoters to make those determinations like where, where does all of that fit for you um, at the moment yeah so this is a topic that's really only recently come up mm -hmm. um so i know that the muay thai australia board have had discussions around this because obviously you know it needs to be incorporated into the rules mm. um so i i guess i i'm not probably one that understands all the facets of this topic of conversation to give an opinion. But mm. um, as a promoter, the only thing that matters to me is the safety of the fighters. So whichever decision is made or whichever path, you know, we go down with matching these fights, if there is an issue with fighter safety, then it can't go ahead. And that doesn't matter what fighters or athletes are involved. So um, it's definitely a topic of discussion that is coming up. Yeah. Um, obviously, there's uh, – I'm sorry, I'm not actually sure of her name, but there was a, a weightlifter that qualified to go to the Olympics, mm. which has been mm. quite controversial. So yeah. I have been trying to keep up with that, but – you know, it's not really a, a, a topic of conversation at the moment in, in Muay Thai, though. Are there any competitors that are kind of pressing – uh, to for four fights that are um, no, to be honest, in yeah. Muay Thai have haven't seen it yet. It ha hasn't popped up. Yeah. Um, it did. It has popped up for discussion because I I'm actually not 100 percent certain, but there was an MMA fighter mm. um, where there was an incident surrounding that, which I think brought the conversation to light in the Muay Thai community, especially with the the government boards. So mm. um, I'm not completely up to date with where we're at with that, but I know it's been a, a pretty open discussion with, with looking at it. I think it's really hard for a lot of sporting organisations that are that are receiving government funding and a lot of that's conditional upon inclusiveness and the like. And and so it does make it very difficult for sporting organisations to to speak their mind clearly on on these subjects. But Oh, it does. And and obviously, you know, we, we want everyone to be involved in combat sports. It's fantastic. Mm. Like it doesn't matter who you are, what background you've got, get involved and and whatnot. So it is it's really hard to to have that conversation, I think, because, you know, at the end of the day everyone wants wants everyone to be involved. But in combat sports we do we do have a safety issue and um yeah, at the end of the day, it people can get seriously hurt. So well, we it, it just, needs to be taken into consideration for sure. Absolutely. I mean, we were just talking about the, the negative effects of just dehydration, but mm. you're know, compounding that with different body types and the like as well can obviously have yep. a tremendous uh, effect. That's right. And I think um, as a promoter, I've come up against it where um, 
I am lucky that we've got quite strict rules against juniors versus seniors. Yeah. But, for example, even a junior female, I won't match with a, a an adult female hmm. because the body structure is different. Um, the hits they can take is completely different. So they might only be four years apart, but at the end of the day, if we put them side by side, it's a match that shouldn't happen for safety problems. Yeah. So that's two people of the same gender. So it's it's definitely a topic that needs to be Definitely um, addressed. Needs to, it definitely needs to be addressed. Um, and for the safety of the athletes as yeah, much as sure. anything. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So, yeah, even just junior versus senior, you know, that's that's definitely something. And sometimes, you know, I will say to the junior fighters, I'm sorry, I can't match that fight. Um, it's not fair. Mm. You know, you, you don't have the, the body structure to be taking that fight just yet. So yeah, Especially if you did put the fight together and then that person got really hurt and I was like. Yeah, that's right. And and as a promoter, I will never match, I promise myself, I'll never match a fight where I know someone's going to get hurt. So mm. there have been, a, you know, matches in the past on cards where you go, you know that person's going to knock them out in 30 seconds. Why do we let that go ahead, you mm. know? If, who cares about the ticket sales? At the end of the yeah. day, that's, you know. And the fans want to see an even fight too. Oh, you know, 100%. It, it doesn't really matter who's fighting. As long as it's even and both fighters are giving it the rule, the crowd are going to love Absolutely, it. That's yeah. exactly right. So, yeah, matching matching fair fights is is so important to me and, and making sure that, you know, people get hurt in a good fight, mm. let alone if you're really mismatching a fight, you know. We don't need, you know, martial Squash arts match, gets it. Yeah. yeah, martial arts can get a bad rap. As mm. it is, let alone if uh, the matchmaking is off. So, yeah, fighter safety should be at the forefront of the sport, one hundred percent. Absolutely, I think uh, commercial um, uh, martial arts or combat sports are, are still um, dealing with that legacy of the early days of the UFC, and and are really conscious of the fact that you know we've got to have a sport that is uh, that's ultimately safe, that's regulated, where precautions are in place to ensure that. that the, the athletes are taken care of uh, before and after the fight. And uh, and I think for the most part, you know, I think the combat sports world's done an amazing job of that, especially in the last few years. Mm, I um, agree. I, th I think things are moving in a great direction. You know, there's always going to be things we can improve on, but, mm. you know, for the most part, I think combat sports is doing brilliantly. And, and what, what what's the future for uh, Muay Thai here in South Australia and in Australia and what are your hopes for the sport in the next few years? Um, well, I just, I hope it gets the the recognition it deserves, which is, it definitely is. So Muay Thai Australia is supported by the government, um, which is incredible. Um, obviously, it's not a, a mainstream sport, but um, there is talk of it now going into the Olympics. So it did get um, it has been so in. That's when we see you come out of retirement. Uh, exactly <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah, just gold, four years, but yeah. four years before it was meant to kick off. I'll be, I'll be back. Um, so yeah, that is a really exciting move for Muay Thai is to to be going to the Olympics, especially because um, you know it's such a strong basis for MMA now, which is massive. So you know to know where that part you know of the striking came from is is pretty awesome, but. There's a lot of tradition behind Muay Thai as well. So, you know, it's, um, yeah, it would be a really cool sport to have in the Olympics. And do you feel that's a natural pathway for a lot of fighters? It's really easy for them to to move from Muay Thai into MMA. They've got a, a, a bit of an advantage in the modern MMA game. Um, yeah, look, I think some of the, the best female strikers that I follow are certainly uh, have Muay Thai backgrounds, which is really cool. So their striking is amazing. I guess it can go both ways though, can't it? There's, you know, grapplers and wrestlers that go in, but I think it's probably easier to have the striking and then learn the ground game than the other way. A lot of people would probably disagree with me, but um, yeah, I do think the striking is important. I yeah. imagine you would think that. But it's yeah. funny. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I might be biased. <laughs> uh, it. It's good seeing uh, the evolution of mixed martial arts. You know, I mean, at the start, uh, jiu-jitsu was just winning against everyone because mm. no one knew what the hell this was. Yeah, it was like, right. Hang on a minute, I'm on the floor and now he's got his legs around my neck and I, <laughs> I'm unconscious. Uh, so, yeah, seeing that sort of jiu-jitsu sort of uh, paved the way in that first, like it was dominating and mm. then wrestlers learned enough sort of jiu-jitsu to avoid being submitted and they were taking people down and, mm. and, and getting submissions that way. And then the kickboxers and the Muay Thai guys learned enough through. wrestling to, <laughs> to not get taken down and they started winning through knockouts. 
Uh, and then you're seeing this this whole sort of change and, and these new techniques will come out and it's like at the moment you know, the low calf kick seems to be mm. a, a mm. big favourite that's like, oh, that was never really used a couple of years ago. And then you know suddenly the, the people are <laughs> using it left, right and centre and winning fights through mm. that, that technique uh, and seeing where it's like, okay, well, this is a new thing. What's the counter to that, to that or what will be the new thing that comes out mm. against that? So. It's very exciting, and uh, it, and seeing all these different elements coming from different sports. Mm. So it's like, well, that that was like maybe this is a Muay Thai technique that oh now we need to learn that. Like mm. you know, we we were we were fine before, but now this person had gone and trained in Muay Thai and they've specialized in this thing and they're dominating with that technique. And oh god, mm. we need to learn that bit and fix that bit there. <laughs> and then it might be something else from wrestling or this. And that's like this always changing game and uh, evolution, and people get better and better and. Uh, yeah, it's it's always good to see somebody coming from a certain discipline or background and saying, mm. "Well, this person is, um, you know, a, a karate fighter, or this person's a wrestler, or this person's from Muay Thai." And you can see that their game is based around that that main skill. So, mm. yeah. and how exciting does it make it? You Absolutely. know, everyone's so different. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, so many different ways to win as well. Yeah. <laughs> is, there, is there a is there a certain uh, technique that you're like, this is my favorite thing, or like I'm really good at this certain thing? Oh, I do have a favourite, and that's the tape. So the push Ooh. kick no, is okay. my absolute favourite. <laughs> it is so underutilised in every combat sport, I reckon. It's, it's To be on the receiving end of a good push kick, it's frustrating <laughs> and it's it hurts. And I just I love it. You know, people often uh, forget about it, and I just love it. Every fight, I throw probably at least 20 of them. <laughs> I well, love it. But now the whole MMA community has just heard that. You're going to start seeing it in the, yeah. in the, in the cage all, yeah. all around the world, uh, the front push kick. That's right. All we, of a sudden. You would have loved it with um, uh, Anderson Silva with Vitor Belfort when he got the, the front kick straight up to the jaw and knocked oh, him yes. out. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm all for the face push kicks, all for it. So do you mix it up? You will go body, body, face, body, face. Like Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> Not in training, though. Only, only ah. in the fights, the face one get to come out, which is why it's <laughs> even better. <laughs> <That's> awesome. <laughs> well, Carly, uh, we did mention earlier, but we've got uh, the Pride Fight Series coming up on the mm-hmm. 24th of July. Yes. And uh, so uh, if people do want to buy their tickets, how can they do that? Where do they need to go? So they can go to the Pride website, which is just pridefightseries.com.au, or they can get their tickets through participating clubs, which is a majority of the Muay Thai clubs in SA. So, yeah, and there'll be a live stream available as well, which we've posted across our social media platforms. So, And if yeah. any parents have been watching today and they're inspired and they want to send their daughters along to learn more about the art of Muay Thai, um, how can they reach out to you? Uh, so we are called Females Fighting Forward and we operate out of Boar's Martial Arts in Woodcroft down south of Adelaide. Um, so you can find us on, on Facebook or, uh, yeah, just get, jump on Google and we're on there and, yeah, give us a call. Fantastic. Come on down. Wonderful. Well, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us again, Carly. Thank you so much for having me. That was great, guys. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. We'll have you on soon. Thanks. Mm-hmm. All right. <laughs>